Morning, everyone. Can you believe we've done 30 days of Proverbs so far? And we're in the 30th Proverb today. And uh, I guess tomorrow is the 1st of May, but we'll do the 31st Proverb tomorrow as well. And uh, let's jump right in. You ready? All right, so we're in Proverbs 30 today. It begins with um, um, godly foolishness, as it were, godly humility, and it contrasts godly humility, which is foolishness to the world, to the foolishness of the world, and uh, it begins and ends with that in this chapter. So we start in verse 2. He says, surely I am more stupid than any man, and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? So, here he says, I'm dumber than any man. And then he says, and then he says, I've, ne I've neither learned wisdom or have knowledge of the Holy One. And so he says, he compares himself to God. And uh, he says, there is a God and I'm not him. And that is humility. I'm not God. There is a God. I'm not God. He compares himself to God. And then he compares himself to everybody else. And he says, I'm not as smart as normal people, all right? I'm more stupid than any man, he says. And he says, surely I am. So he does not put himself over people in general, and he does not uh, put himself over God himself because he says, who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who's bound the water in a garment? Who's established the ends of the earth? He says, I'm not God. And that's where he starts in this chapter. He starts with a level of humility. Where he, I can't give an account for the things that surround me. I can't give an account for the world around me. Uh, and uh, I'm not the master of my own um, world. And so that's how he begins the chapter. How he ends the chapter, if you look at verse 32... He says, if you have been foolish exalting yourself, or if you have desired evil, put your hand on your mouth. For as the churning of milk produces butter and the wringing of the nose produces blood, so the forcing of wrath produces strife. So pride produces strife and trouble, uh, needless trouble. So here he says, if you're foolish in exalting yourself, so there's a foolishness that comes through godly humility and it is to be preferred over the foolishness of exalting yourself above God and above others. All right. Self exaltation is foolishness. And he's going to deal with these two themes in this chapter. There are humility at the beginning and pride and foolishness that comes through exalting yourself at the end. Um, so verse, uh, Verse 5 is the key verse of this chapter for me. It says, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in Him. And that's the bottom line verse of this chapter as we go forward. Verse 6 says, Do not add to His words, lest He rebuke you and you be found a liar. How do we add to God's words? When we exalt ourselves above it, when we are wise in our own eyes, when we're living a life that is not in reverence uh, to God's word or submitted to God's word, um, but his word is pure and he is a shield to those who put their trust in him. He goes on in humility to say, I submit myself to the word of God. I don't add to it. Um, 
And then verse seven, he says, two things I request of you, Lord, deprive me not before I die. Remove falsehood and lies far from me and give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Humility before the Lord says, don't make me too rich, too quick. Um, lest I be like the children of Israel who went into the promised land and forgot the Lord because they got everything they ever wanted because he's a good God. And my greatest fear, if I were to tell my greatest fear, my greatest fear is for God to bless me too much to the point where I don't think I need him anymore. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not begging God for blessings to the point where uh, I just close my Bible and go after blessings. So there's a, there's a level of humility here that says, God, don't bless me too much with too many riches. Um, don't give me more than I can handle in blessing. My dad used to say that success and failure are imposters. And, I, and I, those words ring in my ears. Uh, we don't want to be uh, too over the top with our blessings to the point where we deny the Lord. And we don't want to be to the point where we're starving to death and we profane his name by stealing from others. So this man knew himself. And these are the things he asked of the Lord. He asked also that falsehood and lies be taken far from him and that he be stripped of lying lips. And I pray that too. God, let us be people of truth that are steadily... Uh, uh, taking ground uh, as we grow in character um, and uh, as we grow in you. So we see that this is what he's asked the Lord. And uh, he submitted himself under the pure words of God. And now we're going to deal with uh, the foolishness of this world versus the foolishness of humility. And that's in uh, verse 10. Do not malign a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be found out. Uh, don't try to uh, talk badly about others to get ahead. And then verse 11, there is a generation that curses its father and does not bless its mother. There is a generation that is pure in its own eyes, yet it is not washed from its filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes. And their eyelids are lifted up. There is a generation whose teeth are like swords and whose fangs are like knives. Are the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. So here is a, these are foolish people. And they're foolish because they don't have a godly worldview. And uh, they're pure in their own eyes in everything they do. If you look down to verse 20. This is the way of an adulterous woman. She eats and wipes her mouth and says, I have done no wickedness. So they have rejected God. They've put him out, of, uh, out from in front of them. They've cast him behind their back. And, uh, and they're pure in their own eyes when they treat their parents terribly. They curse their fathers. They don't bless their mothers. They're pure in their own eyes, and they're wretched before the Lord. And then you have adulterous women uh, who eats and wipes her, their mouths and say, I've, I've not done anything wrong. What are you talking about? And this is the generation that we live in today, and this is the generation that this man lived in a gajillion years ago, right? Nothing new under the sun. Um. Let's continue there. Uh, verse 15 talks about moochers. The leech has two daughters, give and give. And there are some people that all they talk about is uh, needing money from you. And we want to be better than the leech, right? And we'll get down to other kinds of insects and animals here in a second. But I don't want to be, if I were, I would rather be compared to an ant or one of these guys that we're going to talk about here in a second, than to a leech. 
And I know that pastors have to take offerings and, and such, but Lord Jesus, help me not to be a leech where people see me coming a mile away. So, oh, Jesus. All right. Um, he's going to talk about what's going on in the world uh, a little bit here. And he talks about the, uh, verse 15, there are three things that are never satisfied. Four, uh, never say enough. And here they are. The grave, the barren womb, the earth that is not satisfied with water, and the fire that never says enough. Uh, the writer compares the grave and the barren womb to the earth that is not satisfied with water and consuming fires on the earth that never say enough. And basically he compares death and barrenness to water and fire. As common as water and fire are to the earth, so is the sadness of this life. This life can be extremely sad and disappointing. Uh, the grave, I, I, I'm amazed at how many funerals I find myself and I, I'm grateful for the opportunity to stand in there at that time and bless the family. But uh, people die all the time, people that we love. And so this world is a very sad place. It can be extremely sad. And then the barren womb, people that cannot have children, uh, extremely difficult on families, uh, marriages that, that can't have children, barrenness and the grave, a dead womb, and we all end up dead. And so here he's speaking about the sadness of life and how we need to appeal to something beyond this life for our happiness and our joy. And that comes from knowing God. That comes from verse five, again, the key verse of this chapter. Every word of God is pure and he is a shield to those that put their trust in him. So as common as water and fire is the grave and the barren womb. And we carry all of us in us a bit of sadness, don't we, uh, living in this life. But our hope is in the Lord and our trust is in the purity of his words that stand the test of time. And that's where we find our ultimate joy. Um, again, verse 17, the eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pluck it out and the young eagles will eat it. Uh, again, this is the foolishness that comes from exalting yourself instead of humbling yourself. Uh, then he goes into things that are wonderful in the world. He's talked about what's sad. He talks about what's wonderful in verse 18, uh, the eagle in the air, uh, the serpent on a rock, a ship in the midst of the seas looking out over an ocean or or a sea and seeing a ship on the sea and the way of a man with his virgin. And uh, he speaks of new love. And these things are wonderful things that he, he, he observes. He observes nature. He observes the ocean and a ship in it, the magic wonder of it. And then he deals with a man with his virgin and how wonderful, uh, uh, intimate love is. So these things bring wonder to our lives, even though we are uh, aware of the sadness of life. Uh, and these are common things in our life. Verse 21 talks about the things that bring anxiety to the earth. The word, uh, three things, the earth, for three things, the earth is perturbed. For four, it cannot bear up. And the perturbed is the word to make anxious or unsettled. And uh, he talks about when things are out of order, when a servant reigns, when a fool is filled with food, when a hateful woman uh, is married, uh, she brings a lot of unsettling in a home. And uh, I guess there are people that just love to hate and, uh, and they're married. Yikes. And then a maidservant who succeeds her mistress or replaces her mistress. So these are people that are out of order. You better find your lane quick and be somebody who walks in under authority uh, or you bring anxiety to people and you perturb 
uh, the earth, the Bible says. Um, verse 24, for there are four things which are little on the earth, but exceedingly wise. And these are my favorites. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their food in the summer. The rock badgers are feeble folk, and yet they make their homes in the crags. And I love these because the ants are not strong, but they prepare. And uh, whatever little strength they have, it says that they are exceedingly wise. And we read about the, the slugger needing to learn from the ant. So you see a little tiny bitty ant. And little tiny insects are wiser than most people. And uh, they prepare their food in the summer. Most people aren't preparing for anything. They're just wandering through life. And then it talks about the rock badgers or feeble folk. They make their homes in the crags. A lot of people think they're strong enough to have uh, a bunch of stuff in their house that doesn't belong in their house. And uh, you need to know your strengths and your weaknesses, don't you? And these are weak animals that build their houses in the rocks where predators can't get to them. So you need to build your house knowing your own limitations and uh, get the junk out that causes you to stumble. Get the junk out of your house that causes you to fall. Take precautions for your life. If you are weak, admit you're weak and get the stuff out of your house that cause you to fall. Amen. Own your weaknesses. Then 27, the locusts have no king and they shall advance in ranks. They don't have a, somebody hitting them over the back to go to work uh, and to uh, advance. They're self-motivators, right? We need to be self-motivators. We don't need somebody pulling our teeth to get us to go to work. And locusts got it down. And then the spider skillfully grasps with its hands and it is in the king's palaces. We've got to go after life and gra grab a hold of life. And uh, a bunch of you are scrappers and nothing's been given to you easy. You've had to go out there and make it happen. And that's what the spider does. And he dwells with king. And so uh, you may be as little as a spider, tiny as an ant in your own estimation, weak as a rock badger, like a locust. You have nobody, you know, uh, no mentors helping you all the time. But you've got to be somebody that goes after life, advances the kingdom of God, uh, prepares for what's coming, and, uh, and make your house safe against the enemy. And then uh, those are the things that are little but wise. And I, boy, I identify with that. I identify with that a lot. I want to be little and I want to be wise. I want to stay little in my own eyes, but God make me wise. In Jesus' name, wise as an ant, wise as a rock badger, wise as a locust, and wise as a spider. God, give me their wisdom. And then uh, verse 29, there are three things which are majestic in pace. And so we've dealt with sadness. We've dealt with wonder. We've dealt, we've dealt with uh, wisdom in the earth. And then we're dealing here with majesty majesty and he talks about a lion he talks about the lion doesn't turn away from anybody i pray for that kind of boldness in our lives that we don't run from trouble or anything that that uh, our church and those that are watching uh, god would not raise up cowards but courageous people bold as a lion the greyhound uh, the male goat these are these are animals that have sure footing and uh, a king whose troops are with him. Uh, he's earned the trust of his troops. Amen. Nobody wants to be a king all alone in a corner. Uh, a king in his own mind. But he has kings with him. He has troops with him. And these are majestic things. So I'm praying majesty over our lives. I'm praying wisdom over our lives. I'm praying wonder over our lives. I'm praying a sobriety that comes that knows that this life is temporal. But in all of it, I pray that we would trust in the pure word of the Lord and find our joy there and know that he is a shield about us. 
and that we wouldn't spend our life exalting ourselves, but, but humbling ourselves, even if we look foolish to everybody else. I pray for a wisdom on you, and I pray for a great humility on you as you come to the uh, realization and you walk in it that there is a God and you are not he. Amen. Amen. So, Father, today we, we pray, Lord, that we wouldn't add to your words through exalting ourselves and being wise in our own eyes as we read in this passage. Those that do evil against their parents and yet are pure in their own eyes. Those that do evil against their spouses and yet are pure in their own eyes. Father, I pray, God, that we would not curse our parents, but we would be a blessing to them. And I pray that we'd be faithful to our homes, oh God. And in times of great sadness, which do come, Lord, unexpected tragedy, Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you uh, steady us and be our joy and our strength. Let us stay close to the pure word of God all the days of our life. Don't give us too much. And Lord, give us our daily portion, I pray. And let us be good business, Father, as we tend our own flocks. And I ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. And for his name's sake, Lord, be our glory, be our shield. We love you today. Amen. Bless you and I love you today, God. Uh, get in your words. Stay in it this week and stay close to your joy. Amen.